do we view the resources that God, the, the financial resources that God has given to us, how do we, uh, how do we view, how, be good stewards of that, view that as part of the kingdom work, uh, at, and, and all of that. So that, I'm looking forward to uh, presenting that. That's Pastor Dale It's going to be presenting that. And then uh, in here, I'm going to be leading a class that's designed to be very practical and, uh, and to add some tools to your Bible study tool bag or to take one of those tools out that you've used in the past and sharpen it a little bit. Uh, but we're going to be doing a Bible study and we're going to be using the book of James and the book of Ruth. And we won't go through both of those books exhaustively, but we're going to use those as texts to practice different Bible study methods and to, uh, to be able to really just get more out of your personal Bible study. Many Christians, I think, approach their personal Bible study with a bit of fear and uh, trepidation. Uh, I hope I get the right thing. I hope I understand this. Uh, Maybe at the end of their Bible study, they're like, nope, I didn't understand that. Well, you can know the Word of God. You have the Holy Spirit living within you if you've trusted Christ, and He will illuminate your eyes to the, the truth in Scripture. We just have to dig and, uh, and work at it a little bit. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking through what that means. So those, those classes both start on June 23rd. On June, 20, on June 16th, that's a Father's Day, we'll actually have uh, a missionary, a Word of Life missionary with us that day who will be uh, talking about his ministry in the Philippines. And um, he met Natalie Dute, who is our missionary to Taiwan. And, uh, and so anyway, there's some connections there. He'll be there the week before. And on the 23rd, we'll start those new classes. So mark your calendars for that and, uh, and be ready to come to that. This weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, it's a time where we remember and thank God for those who have given the ultimate sacrifice, those who have given their lives in protection and defense of this country. And I spoke to a, a number of people prior to this in the, in the past few weeks and uh, really just thinking about um, what, what their testimony is, what their experiences are. And I came to realize, um, <clears throat> again, I would say, but more poignantly, that there are some who, even, even though the loss may have been many years ago, it's still fresh in their minds, um, and, and people deal with that differently. So we have to remember, those of us who maybe have not had that experience, have to remember that this is a time and a, and a weekend where um, that, that memory comes back every year. Um, and so we want to say uh, that, that, uh, that we recognize that. If that's your situation, if you've had that experience of losing a loved one or a fellow uh, brother uh, or sister in arms, um, that is a, um, that's a reality, and we want to remember that this morning. And, and we'll do that in two ways. We're going we're gonna to watch this video here, which really is a prayer, and then Corey's going to open our service uh, as, we, uh, as we think about these things this morning. God, today we stop and thank you for the remarkable courage of our fallen soldiers, for the undeniable strength that they displayed, and for the incredible resolve to serve our country, for the undying beauty of their ultimate sacrifice, for the unflinching devotion to our great nation, for all of those who valiantly rose to the call and for the legacy they left behind for all of us. And God, we pray for the loved ones of the heroes we've lost, for the mothers and fathers, for the brothers and sisters, for the sons and daughters, and for the spouses who bear the void with pride, for all the friends and family with an empty space, that you would comfort those of us who remain, that we would cherish their memory, and that our lives would honor their sacrifice. Lord, help us to always remember what they stood for, to never forget their names, and to carry on their legacy of bravery from this day forward. Amen.
come to your house. Lord, we thank you for this, this time, Lord, as we remember those who have sacrificed, have served to give us this freedom to be, to be here without any fear of persecution, Lord. We pray that we would come into this time with hearts that are ready to worship you, and we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Pastor Nate asked me to share some scripture with you. Uh, he told me a little bit about he's going to be preaching this morning. Said that I could say a few things, but not to preach a whole another sermon. I told him, you don't have to worry about that. It'll, it'll be just fine. But um, 1 Peter 1, 15 says, But as he who called you is holy, so be ye holy in all your conduct. As it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. How do we do this? Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Down in verse 10 it says, For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness.
what Pastor Nate has for us from your word. Help us to be attentive and to hear what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. is what I said. <laughs> Thank you for your participation every Sunday, and uh, I think I've said this a few times, but um, it's a special privilege to be on the receiving end of your worship, and that, don't take that the wrong way. Uh, we are worshiping the, the one true God, but to hear you uh, sing is uh, fantastic, and um, many of you would be like, well, that's just a noise and sometimes it may not even be a joyful noise, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's worship of the one true God, and we're thankful for that. Um, be praying for Pastor and Teresa as they're away, getting some time uh, to refresh, and uh, we certainly love them. We look forward to having them back with us next weekend. Um, this weekend, we are continuing our ser ser series on uh, building blocks of discipleship, and, uh, and, and how, that, how that works within the context of who God is. And so we're focusing on, on God theology proper, as it's called, and then God the Father, and then God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we're continuing to think through who is God this morning. And I wonder if you have ever been stumped by a three-year-old theologian. Many have uh, raised children, and many have taught in children's ministry, and perhaps maybe you've received the question, Mommy, where is God? And you, and you think for a minute and think, that's not easy to answer. <laughs> maybe the, the initial response is, well, He's, he's in heaven. Well, where's that? <laughs> and uh, and these, these three-year-old theologians can, can ans ask some important questions, some significant questions. Perhaps, though, maybe as an adult, you've asked the same question in the midst of a trial. Where is God? Where is He when I need them? Where was God when this happened? And the answer, of course, He's in heaven, doesn't suffice. Where is He? Doesn't mean that He's preoccupied with other things. Um, if He's everywhere, why does He seem to ignore the problem that I'm going through or the pain that I'm in? Or why am I not growing spiritually like I want to if God is here? This is an important question. Where is God? The Bible indicates that He is completely separate from the world. He exists outside of time and space. He is unlike us, and that may leave us feeling distant, alone maybe. And Scripture also teaches that He is near to us, and He's not just kind of close enough to be able to see what's going on, but He's with us. And the term for that is imminent. He's omnipresent in His whole being. One commentator describes this paradox in this way, He, God, transcends all spatial limitations and yet is present in every point of space with His whole being. That's a tough statement to process. How are we to understand this? More importantly, why does it matter? Why is this a good thing? In our series, this building blocks of discipleship, we, we talked about Scripture and then we talked about the sovereignty of God and, and how God's Word is the foundation of our faith and, and how we must believe that He is in control of all things. And if we're to be faithful disciples and to lead others into doing the same, it's important that we understand uh, that, that, uh, that, that this truth is, uh, has a significant role to play in our faith. And so this, th this week's take-home thought is actually uh, from Scripture directly. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you. That's our take-home thought this week. We're going to let that rest and think, let that kind of uh, 
cover the, the text of this, this morning's message, and let me encourage you, um, we are going to move uh, all over the Bible today. If you have the YouVersion app, that is an effective tool, especially this morning. Um, if you would like to, and you're taking notes on that piece of paper, write down the references and come back later and check those out. But we're going to handle this question somewhat topically as we look through the entire Scripture and see what does it mean that God is both far and near. So how do we do this? How do we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? How do we do that? It starts by answering the question that we began with, where is God? Why does that matter? Two helpful terms that we're gonna, I'm going to teach you this morning, transcendence and imminence. The transcendence of God and the imminence of God. Let's start with the transcendence. First of all, remember this, that God exists completely outside of His creation. He is transcendent. What does that mean? Theologians define this in a few different ways. They say that God is separate from and independent of nature and humanity. Uh, They would say that this is the term that emphasizes the distinction of God from His creation and His sovereign exaltation over it. One dictionary uh, definition that I found incredibly helpful is this. God is wholly other. He is not part of the universe. He is not the sum of the parts of the universe. He is not the soul of the universe. He is the eternal, uncreated, absolute, self-contained, self-existent, sovereign creator by whose will and power all things exist. <sighs> Quite the statement. I think we have a concept of this. We, we kind of maybe quickly uh, assent this, um, but it's hard to fully understand what this really means. And so we're going to look at Scripture. Let's look at what the Bible says. First of all, it means that He is beyond what is created. We just said that. Revelation 1 Verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And when King Solomon built his temple in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, he's, he's talking about this house for the Lord that, that has finally been built. And he says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you how much less this house that I've built. Solomon understood that that he was not creating a space that God could finally exist inside of. God was was completely separate from all of these things. Job recognizes this in, in chapter 36, verse 26. He says, Behold, God is great, and we know Him not. The number of His years is unsearchable. In Psalm 113, Verse 5 and 6, we read, Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? And even Jesus taught this. He said of himself, verse 23 of John chapter 8, he said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Even Jesus understood that he was, was not part of this creation. He's beyond creation. He's beyond what is created, space and time. He's also beyond comparison. Have you ever tried to to explain again, maybe to one of those three-year-old theologians, well, God is like, and we we use metaphors that work in our own context to compare God to, well, He's like this. He's beyond comparison. Psalm 40 says, you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. When we, when we start to collect our thoughts of who God is and start to recount to someone else, here is, here is what God is like. We cannot sufficiently do that if we had the rest of our lives to do so. He's beyond comparison. He's beyond understanding. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
You know what the Burj Khalifa is? The Burj Khalifa is a building in Dubai, uh, and it is the tallest man-made structure on the earth to date. It is 2,722 feet tall. It's about half a mile tall. It's the world tallest, uh, world's tallest man-made structure. It, to give you a bit of context, if that's hard to process, uh, the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower, as it is now called in Chicago, right? Take that and then place on top of it the Empire State Building. That's about how tall the Burj Khalifa is. Hard to process even still. Paul Tripp describes visiting Dubai, and he describes seeing this, this hotel. This, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than any one thing. This Burj Khalifa building. And he says this, even from far away, it was hard to crank my head back far enough to see all the way to the top. The closer I got, the more imposing and amazing this structure became. As I walked, there was no thought of the other buildings in Dubai that had previously impressed me. As amazing as those buildings were, they were simply not comparable in stunning architectural grandeur and perfection to this one. And I am not going to judge you if you're Googling it right now. It's okay. When I finally got to the base of the Burj Khalifa, I felt incredibly small, Paul Tripp says, like an ant at the base of a light pole. I entered a futuristic-looking elevator and, in what seemed like seconds, was on the 125th floor, which was not the top of the building, because that was closed to visitors. As I stepped to the windows to get a feel for how high I was and to scan the city of Dubai, I immediately commented on how small the rest of the buildings looked. Those small buildings were skyscrapers that in any other city would have been the buildings that you would have wanted to visit. They looked small, unimpressive, and not worthy of attention, let alone awe. I had experienced the greatest, which put what had impressed me before into proper perspective. Think about that in the context of what we're saying here. In the words of the psalmist, God sits enthroned above all creation. The expanse of the universe, all of the universe, not just this world, but everything that exists is within his view at one time. He can, he can take it all in easily. The earth is his footstool, the psalmist writes. We cannot comprehend this truth. He is completely other. So the question that I asked earlier is, is that good? How is that comforting? How is the fact that God is completely other than us, how does that bring me any sort of peace or comfort? How is it helpful? How has, has God set the earth adrift in the universe and is standing back saying, good luck? That is the thought of a deist. Well, that's not true. Why does it matter that God is transcendent? Let's think about a few things here. First of all, it means that there is a standard of truth. Think about that. If humanity was the, was the pinnacle of all that is, if we have arrived, right, as some might think, then, then humanity is the standard of truth. And isn't that a scary thought? Isaiah understood this when he stands in the throne room of God as he describes this account, encounter in Isaiah chapter 6. He, he stands in the throne room, and God is high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood seraphim, and they're, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. It's a terrifying event, and we know that he eventually just says, I am undone. In Revelation chapter 4, we read in verse 8, the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes and all around and within and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Aren't you glad for this? Aren't you glad that our God is, is not uh, a, a, a product of this world, of this universe, that He's not that he's completely separate from it, and so he's not influenced by it, right? He is the standard of truth. Think about the consequences if humanity was the best thing there was. You can, you can put this into context. If you've ever, some, of, some of you have taught elementary school, and, and I am going to say this. I've not taught elementary school, but I have been an elementary student, 
And when the teacher leaves the classroom, and it, it is, it, 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 there's a direct correlation to the, from the amount of time that is spent outside of the classroom to the level of chaos that is in the classroom. Okay? Some elementary students, I'm looking at, uh, at Katie Barnes right now. I'm looking for her. She's over there. Oh, yeah. Well, she's, she knows what. Ask her. Right? You leave that classroom for too long, and it devolves into chaos. And I certainly, I don't think it was me that was causing any of that. But, um, but I remember some of the other students really being a huge problem. If God removes himself from this world, if he's not in control, if, if, if it's humanity that's left here, then we're in terrible, terrible trouble. But he is a standard. We can, we can look to him as the standard. Here's another thing. God's transcendence reminds us that we need him. It is good to be reminded that you need God. It is good to be, to be meditating on the fact that God demands something from us and that I am not sufficient in, in and of myself. Romans eleven thirty three 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscru- inscrutable are his ways. Reliance on self or for, for spiritual growth is a recipe for disaster. Think about this. When we, re- when we forget or when we refuse to acknowledge that God is not just, uh, is not just greater than us, he's not just bigger uh, or, or a little stronger than us, but he is completely other than us. When we forget to acknowledge that, we start to assume that we can live this life according to my own law. When I forget God, I start to go my own way. Every time I have gone my own way, it has ended poorly. You may have that same experience. God, we need God. We need this transcendent God who is, who is not influenced by this world. Here's another very important thing. It means that salvation is not our own making, is not our own doing. And as, as, as often as we desire to save ourselves, humanity likes to, to think about, especially Americans, like to think about pulling myself up by my bootstraps and, and, and I can do this. I can earn my way into this with enough work. It just doesn't work like that. God is separate from us and salvation is from Him and that is a good thing. Salvation, God's salvation is not subject to change. That's another one. Because God exists outside of this creation, outside of this world, he is not subject to it, and so he does not change. There is no effect on him. The, the, the things of this world affect us, and we change regularly, right? But God isn't, isn't touched by that. James chapter 1, verse 17 and 18 say, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Aren't you glad that this world doesn't influence God? Isn't that a comforting thought to know that our God is not going to be different tomorrow if something bad happens? All of this means that we must worship him. All of this truth that, that he is completely other than us means we have no, no other recourse but to stand to fall in front of him like Isaiah did and say, we are undone, and to worship. We have to see God for who he is. God is not our buddy. God is not just one of the many influences in my life. Yes, I, I take, you know, some would say, yeah, I have my... Uh, my religion and who God is, and that helps me over here, and then I have uh, my, my education, and that helps me over here. No, no, God isn't just one of the influences. He's not part of this world. My decisions have no effect on Him. The only right response is to fall down like Isaiah in full acknowledgement of His right to demand worship, to demand holiness, as Corey read, to direct our lives as He sees fit. He is God. And we are not, and so often we try to be. He is transcendent. He is completely other than us. 
And if you're feeling now, as some might, ah, I'm feeling a little further away from God today. I, I feel as if I can't bridge that gap to Him. That's right. I feel as if I, I, I am unworthy. Yeah, we are. We are sinners. We have broken His law, and He has the right to do with us what He will. But also, He's near to us. Scripture talks about this. Now, we have this on the, bring up the next slide. God is both present and active in every part of His creation. This is talking about imminence. I spelt this wrong all week. This typo is my fault, not Erica's. And there's a difference because imminent is talking about his, uh, like Christ's imminent return. It's about to happen, okay? We're talking kind of a chronological thing. What we're talking about this morning is imminent. So get your, you know, pens out, scratch out the I, put an A in here. But we got to, it's important. I had to mention that because these are actual terms that mean slightly different things. So we're talking about God's imminence, imminence. My broken phonics um, it, it affected that this week, but we'll move on. Think about this. God is both present and active in every part of His creation. He's outside of it all, but He has not let it go. He is active and is working. What does that mean? Again, a definition. This term imminence is not antagonistic to His transcendence. It doesn't fight or, or rub against it. He is imminent in that He is omnipresent throughout His creation. And yet, He is transcendent in that He is personally and essentially distinct from it and infinitely superior to His creation. Some view God as having begun all things and then leaving the world to fend for itself. They see Him as distant or indifferent. As a God who does not bother Himself with the affairs of this world, they see the natural order as all that there is. We are, we are stuck in the in, in this simulation, so to speak, and, and we, are, we are here to fend for ourselves. That is not who God is. He is not distant. He is other than, but He is not distant. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses says, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, whenever we call upon Him? Think about Moses writing that as he experienced, after he has experienced this is Deuteronomy. This is the end of Moses' life. Think of the experiences that he has seen, how God has proven over and over and over again that he is there. He is with them even when they fail him. He is active in creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the second verse of the Bible speaks about how the Spirit moved across the surface, hovering over the face of the waters, it says. Genesis chapter 2 then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Without God breathing life into man, we would not be who we are. Job said this, the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. We, he sustains life. He doesn't just give life. He sustains it. Uh, in Psalm 104, we see actually talking about the animal uh, kingdom, right? And the animal, different animals, and, and the psalmist writes, these, these animals, all look to you they, to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. And when you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. God is imminently working even in the animals, right? Colossians chapter 1, speaking of Jesus and His deity, says, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. There's some science here that other more intelligent people with regard to science could explain to us, but there is uh, the reality that, that stuff is being held together, and it's not easily understandable why that is, why atoms don't just go... Whoosh, well, I think I know, because the Bible says that Jesus is holding it all together. The God of this universe is, is sustaining it, keeping it. He is not almost here, imminent. He is always everywhere, imminent. <laughs> Easy, right? This is not pantheism. Understand that. Pantheism would say God is in everything. 
that tree is part of who God is, and, and, and that bird and the wind and, and me and you, and, and that's, that's pantheism. But, but, but this is a theism with a God who is not distant, who is working. So why is that good? Why is it good that God is actively in control of the things around us in this world? Well, a couple things to think through here. One, He ordains what will be. The apparent chaos around us isn't out of His control. He is working through it. Isaiah 37, verse 26, have you not heard that I determined, determined it long ago? I planned from the days of old what now I bring to pass. God is in control, and it's not that He's trying to keep up with the ever-changing world. He is imminently working. He has planned it. God is not limited to working directly or supernaturally. He can heal by miraculous means, or He can heal through the careful skill of a doctor. He can provide through a sudden gift or through a steady job. He may use sinful people to accomplish His will. Habakkuk is all about how God is saying, I am going to bring uh, punishment on the nation of Israel, and I'm going to use the Babylonians. And Habakkuk is scratching his head saying, why? They're the worst. And God is sovereign over this, and He's using the events of this world and everything to accomplish His purpose. He is active in every natural disaster and in every warm, breezy day. He is imminent. It's good that He's in control of these things. He has not lost control. What that means then is that we must follow Him. That's discipleship, to follow the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. This, this is the, remember our take-home thought, our verse, humble yourselves in the, under the mighty hand of God? This is that moment where, I don't, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. The circumstances of my life don't make sense to me, but I trust you because you are working. You are imminent. Isaiah 55, verse 6, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. He is, he is with us. He's working. He's working. He ordains what will be. He also knows us. Like, oh, I don't like thinking about that. That's true. Psalm 139, this is an excellent passage, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but I'd like to read for you the first 12 verses. Psalm 139, just listen to, uh, to, the, to the imminence of God. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down are, and are acquainted with all my days. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. God knows what we're going to say before we do. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. He is guiding us. The path that I take, even, even the mistakes that I am making are part of what He is using to hopefully draw my heart to Him. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. There is nowhere we can go where God does not know us. That means we must submit to Him, right? At the end of this passage, the psalmist writes this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous or wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist is meditating on the fact God knows me. God knows me. 
oh man, he knows, oh, he knows more about me than I know about me. The only response that is warranted after thinking about that and the way that he does is to say, okay, search me. You, show me what's wrong with me. Help me know and lead me in the way everlasting. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Think about the person who knows you best. So your best friend, maybe your spouse, maybe a parent, right? They know us, and, and while we don't always treat them this way, that means they have earned the right maybe uh, to present a critique or some guidance, right? I, the people that know me best, Pastor Dale knows me pretty good, I think. He's, he's a good, he has a pretty good way of reading people. And, uh, and, and there are times where he's like, hey, Nate, you, you, know, you, you might want to think about this. Yeah, you know what? He has earned that right. He knows me. How much more? The people around us don't know us, really. They don't know my thoughts or my intentions, my motives, but God does. He knows everything about me, and He has certainly earned that right because He is sovereign over all things. We must submit to Him in humility. One more. He cares for us. More than simply knowing us, He cares. Think about that. Let that sink in. The God of this universe, the God who is completely other, separate from, who, who we have no right to even approach, He is active around us. He is interested. He knows us, and He cares for us. Matthew 6 Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Psalm 34, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 145, the Lord is near to all who call on Him and to all who call on Him in truth. God cares. This transcendent God that we worship, that we have no right to even be in His presence, has welcomed us, and, and not just welcomed us to have relationship with Him, but on, on His terms, which is the right way to think about it, but that He cares for us. This means that we can turn to Him in trouble. And again, think about our take-home thought today. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. The next verse says, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. What do I do with this? The transcendence of God, the imminence of God. How do I take this and use this in discipleship? How do I... How do I process this. This is big stuff. This is deep theology. Well, it's, it's attainable and practical. Think of it this way, two words, worship and follow. Let our discipleship be an expression of the utter submission to an almighty God that, that He deserves, right? Isaiah 57, listen to this verse. I saved it for last. Isaiah 57 verse 15, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Stop there for a minute. There's your transcendence. The God who inhabits eternity. I dwell in a high and holy place. Yes, Lord. We, we, are, we, we are not... We are your subjects. And next he says this, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Think about that. The God of this universe who inhabits eternity, who is high and lifted up, who is holy and righteous and, and is completely separate from sin, the God who we have separated ourselves from because of our sin is, is inhabits, He is high and holy, holy, right? Lifted up and also with those who are of a humble spirit. Also with those 
who are of a contrite heart, who, who view themselves correctly and say, Lord, thank you. I do not deserve this. Where is God? He's greater than us. Where, we, we are His creation. We owe our very breath to Him. And He sustains all that is and determines what is right. He is the height of, uh, of I'm sorry, it is the height of arrogance to assume that I can determine what is best for my life. And yet, He is also with those who are of a contrite spirit. Wow. All that is needed to experience the closeness of God is a heart that acknowledges its sin and relies on, on God's grace for forgiveness. Did you catch that? The only thing that is required, the only thing that our great God requires of us is to acknowledge our sin and our sinfulness and to rely on His grace, and we can experience the closeness, the imminence of God. Let's show the take-home thought one more time. Look at this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. The right response to this is simply humility. God, okay, you're, you, you are in control of this. I am not. And what will happen? So that at the proper time, he may exalt you. The context of this verse is suffering. Peter's writing to those who are being persecuted. So in exalt, and in the context there, it may be suffering. It may also be spiritual growth. How is God going to lift you up? The only, time, the only, the only lifting up that's going to happen is, comes when we are humble before God. Personal growth, discipleship, whatever it may be, even just the confidence to live for the Lord today. Whatever it may be that you, you feel depleted in, maybe. Look to God. Put Him in the right place. God is not, there's a great title of a book that says when God, when people are big and God is small. Often we do this. We think, we think of God too, with too small of a context. We need to place him where he is as the sovereign ruler of all things, completely separate from us. We are his creation and we are created to reflect his glory. That's it. But he cares for us and he knows us. And he gives his son, Jesus Christ, in, 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 a, in a measure of grace that we could never have earned for ourselves, he gives to us the opportunity through salvation to be right with him and to experience a closeness that can only be experienced if God decides it should happen. And we do that through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I'll say this, have you believed that? If not, believe it today. Turn to Jesus. Second of all, if you're struggling, if you're discouraged or, or suffering or, uh, or not growing spiritually, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and He will lift you up. Let's pray. Father, You are our Savior. You are more than, than what we can imagine. We cannot comprehend Your goodness. We cannot comprehend Your power. We are eternally grateful, and yet we're often ungrateful. We are indebted to you, and yet we often live as if you owe us something. Lord, we are frail and weak, sinful, and we deserve to be separated from you, and yet you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to bring us close. And as, and as we believe in that, Lord, and we, we desire to grow in that knowledge, you give to us what we need to do that as well. So we thank you. We turn to you, and we, we, we rejoice in your faithfulness to us. And we ask, Lord, that you would, you would uh, work in our hearts even now. Lord, as we, as we conclude this service, I pray that if there's any here that do not know of the, of the forgiveness of sin that the Bible talks about through the power of Jesus Christ, that they would come, either talk to me this morning uh, down front or... or Catch me afterwards one way or the other. I pray that you would, uh, you would cause people to turn to Christ. And for those who have, Lord, I pray that you would work in their hearts even as we sing this last song. Help us, Lord, to respond correctly to your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand and sing with us.
us to be able to be in your house, Lord. It says in your word where two or three are gathered in your name, you are here, Lord, and you are holy. Help us to take this, what you've put on our hearts through Pastor Nate, that we would walk in it, walk in freedom as we go out these doors. We'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.